blame Canada indeed on Dave's Gone By, except we're not going to blame Canada, because I have a fabulous time, and I hope that um, my guest Perry Tannenbaum from Creative Loafing had as good a time as I did on the Canada trip. Perry, are you with us? Uh, I'm with you. Oh, great, great. How are you doing? How You went somewhere even after Canada. Like, I, I just got to go home and veg and work. What did you do? <laughs> we stayed over in Stratford. And, uh, you and your lovely wife, Sue. That's correct. Mm-hmm. And then we uh, drove over to the shore of uh, Lake uh, Huron and saw a couple towns there, drove up and down the coast, and mm-hmm. took a, a few photos, <laughs> and came back and uh, immersed ourselves in some car theater. We stayed over to see South Pacific, because uh, when I went to the festival back in 2003, I was just so impressed with their production of The King and I that I just had a feeling that this was also going to be very special. Now, South Pacific was at the shore or the Strat? That was at the Stratford. Okay, and how was the South Pacific there? I didn't see it. I, I, th- I think it was the best thing I saw there. Oh, really? Yes, okay. Indeed. Go figure, I missed it. Well, so, why was this such a special... You know, we haven't had a South Pacific revival on Broadway in... I don't know if it's been done since the original on Broadway. Um, and, and they're thinking of doing one in, in a season or two, uh-huh. finally. So what was so great about seeing it there? Well, I, I like the fact that the uh, production was just so full. It was a kind of bamboo motif uh, that characterized every scene. And I thought the Nellie Forbush, uh, particularly by Cynthia Dale, was very freshly imagined. Uh, How was she different from, say, Mary Martin or whoever else did Nellie? Well, I care. Okay. Well. <laughs> a real attempt to do a little rock accent, though it comes out as a kind a of... A little what accent? A little rock. A little rock, okay, yeah. Accent. So it comes out as a kind of generic southern accent. Mm-hmm. And uh, just fresh touches, like having the wash that man right out of my hair, choreographed in a shower with uh, the girls splashing. Uh, I like that. I, mean, I like just, that a lot. Just it was just very creative, and when she sang She's in Love with a Wonderful Guy, she just kind of said, I'm the conventional dinner, and she kind of shook her head a little bit, hmm. uh, which is kind of what I like to point to that's special about the, what the Stratford does with the musicals. They really respect and deep think uh, the books of these classic musicals and respect them as much as they respect the Shakespeare. Hmm. Well, it I mean, really isn't a conventional dither, and it's the conventional she learned down in Little Rock, which causes her, causes her, I should say, to kind of temporarily alienate her affections from Emile de Beck. And then, you know, after thinking it over a little bit, saying, and seeing that he's risking his life, you know, kind of getting back into it. Whereas I feel sometimes, especially in the movie, that... Uh, if you're a traditional, you know, kind of rock-ribbed uh, Protestant or something like that, you really wouldn't bend so quickly. Hmm. Okay. I get, I get it this time around. It, 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 there is a kind of wavering, and it's uh, because uh, just kind of temporarily the, the shock of seeing those kids uh, puts her off. Now, did you, um, was, that was your favorite thing of all that you saw at both the Shaw Festival and the Str- No, what? what, what Jeff, why you left? Oh. Yeah, that was, that, that was probably the favorite thing I, I saw altogether, but there were a lot of uh, close runners up, I would say. I mean, I liked the Stratford's Oliver, too. Now, Oliver's another show. It was done about, 50, well, maybe 20 years ago. They revived it with Ron Moody. Mm-hmm. on Broadway to get... He was basically the selling point. They got the same guy doing Fagin from the Carol Reed movie, and, and Peggy Lupone was in it. I, I didn't get to see it. Um, but there was also talk of bringing, again, another Oliver to New York. That has not happened. So I was really happy to see a professional production of it. I was surprised at how quickly it moved. The show was just over two hours long. Right. Which I think... I mean, I think the movie's two hours and 45 minutes, so, so they must have added in the movie. Uh, I liked Colm Fiore as Fagin quite a bit. What did you think of him? I, I thought he was a little PC for me, a little, uh, th- there was no ethnic sort of thing. He wasn't uh, Jewish enough. He wasn't Jewish enough. There wasn't a kind of wily craftiness to him. Uh, he was doing it from the viewpoint of being a kind of pragmatic businessman. 
Mm -hmm. uh, which I think is a valid interpretation, uh, which I think he sells capably enough, but I think it takes some of the, of the real flavor uh, of the story away from it. Well, he seems a very sweet, I and mean, even more so than Ron Moody was. And Ron Moody was a pretty lovable um, Fagan, but he's a very, not only is it a business for him, but it's also, he, he likes those kids. I mean, these are, um, as someone had overheard Fiore talking, or maybe it was in an interview, saying that one of the things that he was playing when he was doing Fagan is that Fagan is tremendously lonely. You know, he's, he's an outcast, he's, he's a Jew in that society, and he's a criminal in that society. So he's a double outcast, and he's not, doesn't have a wife, doesn't have a family, um, and he doesn't have kids. So these are all a surrogate family for him, and that's why he cares about these children so much. I do think you get a very strong feeling in this, Oliver, that this is the first or, or the best father that, that Oliver has had up until this point mm. by a significant margin. Yes, I'll agree with you there. Now, let's, let's, first of all, we've been, we jumped right into the plays, but um, you've been to the Shaw, Nut Niagara area before, right? That's correct. So it's a pretty neat little boutique sort of town. Um, I, I know before I went, our program director here, Tom Ross, said, okay, if you're going to do anything in Niagara-on-the-Lake in that Shaw area, the theater aside, you got to go to Greaves Jellies and Jams. <laughs> which, which was basically, I think, his way of saying, if you're going and you don't bring me back some Greaves Jelly and Jam, you're fired. <laughs> so I damn well did. But um, he was right. I mean, I don't like Jellies and Jams for the most part. But I went to that place, tried one, and my wife's been putting them in yogurt all week long, and it's just fabulous. It's, you know, it's just yummy, yummy. You can't get it in America. So I think you have to physically go over there or go to their website. But that's the kind of place that fills up Niagara on the Lake, like these little boutique shops and stuff. Do you have any favorites uh, that, that you're into? I think there's a, a leather shop called Leonardo's where I <laughs> bought a leather jacket the last time that I still use. And, uh, it is got a better break Sunday. on the Canadian currency <laughs> that time around than, than there would be this time around. Yeah, and and the restaurants are kind of you know, little on the pricey side for the most part. <laughs> yes. You know, I mean, I didn't go to the Chinese place. I assumed they were more rational. Uh, there's a place called Fornos that had you know basic, pretty half decent American fare that was a more standard you know price. But some of the things were like twenty five, thirty dollars an entree, just a la carte. And I was like, oh man. That's because you got a bad exchange rate. Yeah. Well, yeah. The exchange rate used to be amazing. What, how long have you been coming to the Shaw Festival? Or, or, or Stratford? Uh, this is my second time. I went up in 2003 for the first time. What was the dollar for dollar back then, only three years ago? Was it like this? No, I think it was like uh, 75 uh, Canadian... To, to a dollar American, right? or, or 75, something like that. 75 American to a dollar Canadian. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Canada struck oil. Is that it? I mean, it must be. I mean, they don't need the euro. It's now literally a dollar to a dollar five. So anything you're getting there is the same exact money. Right. So, I, like, we ain't... I was uh, at a bread and breakfast where somebody said, let's, let's just have a continental currency. Hmm. <laughs> of course, the Mexicans want to get in on, on that scam. <laughs> well, no, but, but, like, if you go to a restaurant, I guess, like, five years ago, if a Canadian restaurant charged $25 for a piece of fish... An American would tally that in his head and go, "Oh well, it's eighteen dollars, all right." Now it's it is twenty five bucks or something. It's a little a little weird to get used to that. Imagine that Canadian money is real, <laughs> just barely. Just barely. I think when I was young, many many years ago, it, it was also there, there was near parity back then, but it hasn't been like I said, like 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 you're like you're saying for decades like that at all. And what did you think of the hotel? We're staying at the uh, Princess of Wales. Or Prince of Wales. Like Prince of Wales. Prince of Wales. I, oh I make God. a female for Gay Friday. Yeah. Uh, soup to nuts. They've got it all covered. It's, it's elegance personified. It was funny. My, my wife and I, when we got there, we were told that basic part, the main part of the hotel was filled up. And that we had to go like across the street to a cottage. 
And I'm like, oh, great. This is, this is, <laughs> what, a, what a wonderful way to start a trip where they're kind of putting us off to the service area of, of everything. And then we open up the door of this quote-unquote cottage, and it's just like one of the nicest places we've ever seen. Mm-hmm. Done up in... What was funny was we didn't really think much of it per se as far as the decor. We just thought it was really fancy looking. It had a, a little fake... Fu- well, it's a real working fireplace, except you don't have to put any wood in it. It just has like a, a switch that you flip and there's fire. And the bathroom is like the size of the studio with a jacuzzi and a, and a bidet. I don't know what the what would you, what do you need a bidet for? Cleanliness. <laughs> can someone just explain why you can't just cleanliness? Wipe? So you take from the sink a little water, and you go between the cheeks. And it that's, just doesn't squirt up with that power. Is that what it's all about? Yeah, it's about cleanliness. Is it an enema? Does it go into you? D- yeah. The, really? The, well, it, you know, you can point it wherever you want. <laughs> well, you, well, yes, I imagine so. Uh, but it go it shoots very hard up your butt. If you like, you you can adjust pressure. Yeah. It's all about cleanliness. I know, but then you still have to wipe because you're all wet. Yeah, but you're not wet with, dare well, I well, say no. it? Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay, yeah, no. But then again, no, if, you don't shoot if it, it goes that high up, you're going to go to, to like your bed afterwards, and you're going to be leaking for an hour. <laughs> it's just going to be dripping out of you little by little. Why do people take enemas? Because oh, th- they have to. You don't take an enema just, well, maybe you take an enema just for fun no. on Game Pride Day, but, but the rest of us, you take an enema because you're blocked yeah, up. He, he was into enema. What, what was that? <laughs> <laughs> you didn't know you'd be lulled into the <laughs> enema conversation, did oh, you? En- no. Enemas and I go way back. I'll explain that when I have more time sometime, but <laughs> enemas are a very big thing with me. I'm, I'm you know, very excited about, about colonics. <laughs> <laughs> High and low. <laughs> no, but, but I'm just that saying that. That was gorgeous. I mean, it was it was, yeah, it was it was beautiful place. Yeah, but the reason I brought that up was we had in this cottage, like the side by side. So our next door neighbors, who were also members of the critics organization, you know, they looked in while we were coming in, and they were like, "Oh my God, you got the whore room," because it was all red like a bordello. I mean, like the canopy, I mean, everything was like red, uh-huh. and it was it was like the whore sex room. And I I looked at well, don't you guys have? They had this blue kind of. Um, very nautical themed, but also very very nice. But you know, I thought, oh, okay, they get <laughs> considering who they were, they got the semen room. <laughs> and seriously, <laughs> but anyway, how did we get on that topic? You brought it up because I brought it up. <laughs> That's right. Well, I, I I will say that when we came back, like five days later, uh, my wonderful wife Sue found this. Bread and breakfast, well, uh, Perry, kind of you, all the way around on... Perry, uh, can you talk a little louder or closer to the, the phone? Oh, okay. Uh, my wonderful wife found, found this wonderful bread and breakfast on Simcoe Street mm-hmm. uh, that just had this incredible decor and, and served up some really nice uh, gourmet, uh, a, a nice gourmet breakfast of, uh, on top of having art on display in the kitchen. So it was a kind of combination uh, gallery, uh, bed and breakfast, and, and there was like a reading room that was almost like a travel library. Did you have any like special Canadian food like back bacon or donuts or, or any weird kind of Canadian? Donuts thing? are Canadian? Well, well, if they're made in Canada, I guess they are. Then all the food was there was Canadian. Well, yes. <laughs> well, it's like the important stuff. So, but do you, do you have any Canadian real special kind of... I, I didn't, as far as I recall. I could have. There was Canadian one breakfast cuisine. Thing. Yeah, no, there, there was one place that we had gone for breakfast on our last day. And it was like a sandwich and wrap shop, but a little sort of special, kind of a nookie kind of place. And they had this weird thing that was a mix of little bacon crumbles and egg and stuff, and I didn't get it. But I was That's called tempted. a Denver omelet. No, I mean, you know, it's more of a mushy <laughs> thing in there. Gosh, aren't you glad you called in, Perry? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm all, eggs that stuff. Again. all right, let's get back to the theater then. I want so, to hear about this. What? What? So, Perry, t- I don't know. I've never been on one of these conclaves. What? What exactly do you do? You get there, you get into your hotel, and what do you do? Uh, I go to sleep. Okay, and then you wake up. Well, Perry, you're a little boring for us. <laughs> <laughs> So, there so are these meetings, which are, you know... Uh, you, did you get the whore room, too, by the way? Oh, my heavens. What? Did you get a whore room, too? No, I didn't get a whore room. 
I got this <laughs> Edwardian deal. Oh, nice. wow. Kind of elegance and the uh, very wallpaper and antique furniture and nice. You were all right. Okay, so you get up, you peel the wallpaper off the wall, and then what do you do? You bang through a couple of times, and hey, then what? We don't what? talk about that. Okay. We only talk about your sex life. Yeah, you, you, you rummage around, you eat a continental breakfast. But when does the theater start? You're there on a theater conclave. What's that? You're there on a theater expedition. Well, yeah, then you have all this administrative gobbledygook from yeah. the organization itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then you have some guest speakers, some of which, some of whom are very interesting and uh, actually say something illuminating about... Uh, Who spoke? The, the authors, uh, the, the playwrights that we're going to see. Well, Richard, oh. Mon um, not Richard Monet, the, the guy from um, the Shaw spoke at a lunch. He was very, very good. Jackie Maxwell spoke at the oh, festival. Jackie Maxwell theater. was at the Shaw, and then, then Simoletti from the Stratford right. also uh, addressed us. I thought he was pretty good. I, um, I missed her thing, but he was talking about Coriolanus, and, and he didn't even do the joke about being a Coriol man with a Coriolanus, but... Uh, no. Well, we'll send him to the bidet. <clears throat> no, but I thought that w that was really good to hear from him about that show, where I'm not sure I agree with him, where he said it was sh as dark and as vicious and cynical as Shakespeare was ever going to get. Mm -hmm. Shakespeare, like, went to the limit on that play of showing the ugly side of human nature, mm. and then he couldn't. He pulled back and went towards, what like, magic realism and fables and, and kind of, you know, spiritual stuff. And again, it, it, it went to uh, Webster to go deeper and darker with the Duchess of Malfi. What, Shakespeare just couldn't go any further. Although, I don't know, I don't find Coriolanus any more rough than Titus Andronicus. As a matter of fact, I find Coriolanus a kind of counterbalance to Julius Caesar in terms of Shakespeare being able to take both sides in the monarchy versus democracy argument. Mm -hmm. uh, Coriolanus, I find to be very anti-democratic, very much against the rabble, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I find Julius Caesar to be very much in favor of grassroots politics. Well, and Caesar was earlier, though, right? What's that? S Caesar was earlier, though. Correct. Coriolanus, so... uh, as we were told, is the last of, of the tragedies before Shakespeare kind of closed the book on that uh uh, on that sector of his output and went to the romances. Maybe Shakespeare just fired the guy who was writing his tragedies at that point. <laughs> <And by> the, <laughs> he hired a different guy. It was, it was a much more humorous fella. <laughs> Couldn't get a guy to play Coriolanus oh, uh, yeah. roles anymore. Yeah. Now, now how many, how many um, sonnets did Shakespeare write? Was it 38, 37, something like that? No, wait. 154, I believe. Oh, gosh. I thought it was 154. Yeah, 150. 150, holy crap, yeah. he was busy. Was it? I always ask that question because the number of my house is 154, and that's oh. when I learned it. <laughs> it came up on Jeopardy one day. I said, oh, my God, I'm living in the number of silence. <laughs> anyway. Anyway. But how many limericks did he do? What? How many limericks did he do? There was an old man from Stratford. Right, yeah. His wife in oh. anyway. I beg your pardon, yeah. So, so tell me, what else? After you... There was so a Coriolanus. No, wait, wait, wait. I just want to find out about yeah, this yeah. trip. So okay. you, you now do a couple of administrative things. You hear a couple of people talk. And do you go as a group, or do you have all these shows to choose from? What, how, is that, how does that work? Mostly, we're, we're uh, especially if you look back over the totality of all these uh, con uh, of all these conferences, uh, the the program and the theater uh, selections that we're going to have are pretty much laid out. There's like maybe one option usually per trip. Uh, in, in this case, because we were doing a festival, uh, you might think there would be less choice because we're not doing a whole bunch of companies. But uh, in this case, with so much going on at the Shaw and at uh, Stratford, there, there was actually more choice than usual. Oh, that's good. So, but so these shows will like open; they'll run for a couple of weeks, and local yokels will come in, and then like one week, one week you come in, and there are like 300 theater critics in the audience. Well, that must be quite a well, daunting. Well, this is not a local yokel kind of a place. I know, sure, I know. I'm, 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 I'm just making I'm, a joke. No, but it's also, they, there's a season. The season goes from about late April no, all but, the way to but October. No, but is, like, the entire audience filled with theater critics at one point? Um, no, 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 no. How uh, many people... How many people uh, I guess the closest house? it came to being that was when we were at the, the Courthouse Theater at, at the Shaw, which is the smallest 
of the venues that we were at. It's kind mm-hmm. of a studio size, but uh, there you know, holds maybe three, four hundred people, and we wow. were a crowd of maybe seventy. Yeah, our our organization, the, the American Theatre Critics, has somewhere between two and three hundred, close to three hundred total members. They don't go. T- they don't all go on a tour. How, how many so old, they how go many in the bathroom. <laughs> How many of us thought they could live in yours? <laughs> how many? How many people attended this? About a hundred. Okay, so and, uh, so and that, that includes like a, a critic and your wife or your guest or something. So that's hundred mm-hmm. total people. So if we go so to they, some theaters like um, where we would see in Stratford or Oliver, some of those theaters were several hundred seats. So we weren't the whole audience. But you were hundred of them. Anywhere from fifty to hundred, mm-hmm. all of us, you know. Not and again, we split up some. Did you did you ever ask the actors what that was like to know that there are like a hundred theater critics in the audience? Well, what actor doesn't go through that in New York on the on during press week or or an opening night? In or New York, we're all critics, but yeah. So I'm sure they're, you know. <laughs> opening night, yeah, it's tough to get a press seat. I mean, I, I, you know, not not to uh, steal your thunder, Perry, but one of the things that at Atka, the, the theater critics thing that we're used to is any time we go anywhere and have a speech made to us, maybe it's an artistic director welcoming us to their theater, you know, during a pre-theater dinner, mm-hmm. maybe it's the local chamber of commerce person, maybe like we all went to a local winery because we have travel writers and stuff like that. Invariably, we dread that moment when they start their speech and they go, boy, this is, this is just what I love having to make a speech in front of a bunch of theater critics. And then we all have to, to, to laugh and go, like, we've never heard that line before. Because it's, it's the only line we ever hear. And, and they have to say it, and we have to hear it. It's just part of the, the drill, you know? It's a part of the ritual. Mm-hmm. Oh, by the way, speaking of part of the ritual, i got to do some ads. Perry, Jeff, you want to stick around for a little bit? Absolutely. Okay, we'll do. Okay, everybody, we'll be back with more Dave's Gone By right after these messages on Dave's Gone By on this Sunday night. We're here with my good friend Jeff Goodman of the Manhattan Cable Television Show 2 on the Isle, which he co-hosts with Charles Gross every other Friday. Uh, to find out more about that, go to mnn. Is it org or com, Jeff? I don't know. <laughs> Google it. Manhattan Neighborhood well, Network. Well, Googling it, don't, can't you see it on Google or something? Oh, that's right. That's right. Charlie has also started putting uh, on uh, video.google.com episodes. In fact, the first episode that he did was our Tony Prediction Show, where I was uh, very happy to be a guest. Where David is fabulous. Thank you so much, Jeff. Thank you. And But he's also going to be putting all the upcoming episodes on there. I think at a certain point you'll have to pay for them. Because you know you can never get enough of me. Oh, well, of course not. <laughs> Jeff, is, Jeff is worth every penny. So that's Manhattan Neighborhood Network. And Google it's all it about and go like a dollar, I think. <laughs> well, yeah, that's all it is. And also on the line from South Carolina, critic Perry Tannenbaum. Perry, you still with us? I'm still with you. Yay, and we've been talking about... And you're worth every penny too, Perry. Every, uh, Perry's worth every penny. Right. Yes, Absolutely. I okay. do want to correct. The, the, the creative loafing actually comes out in Charlotte, North Carolina. North Carolina. I, I can't get that straight, but you cover it's North and South for a couple of different things, It's kind things, of like right? those Dakotas. Where is, where is, where are yeah. those presidential faces? So, so actually, but do tell people where else you write for, Pear. I also write for the Fort Mill Times down in South Carolina. I okay. also write for Theater Mania, Backstage.com, and covering my performing arts beat. Uh, I also write for American Record Guide. Cool. Hey, and don't you write for something called Total Theater? Total Theater. Oh, theater. I've heard of them. Yeah. Th- thanks for thanks for not even thinking of that one. <laughs> one of my sponsors. Thank you so well, much. Well, what do you want? He's by Carolinian. By Carolinian. You're, oh, I, um, does your wife I actually know? done a couple of uh, features, uh, or will have done a couple of features in Stage Directions magazine of a more technical sort. Ooh. Oh, cool. Uh, actually, Iris Dorbian has been on the show. A couple of times. She's the uh, the editor there. Right. So say hi to her. met her when we came up to New York. That's when we go up. We go up uh, early in the year when, when Sue has her school vacation. But now that she's retired, we have a little more flexibility, and we might be able to get in when uh, ATCA has their uh, little winter thing. Yeah, it'll be in New York this year. Yeah. So that'll, that'll be Ooh. cool. Let's get back to the theater, though. So, so some of the, we talked about the musicals a lot. Um, and also, what like shows did you see? Yeah, what else? What other shows did you see and like? What shows did you hate? What shows did I hate? Oh, 
What I would say? say a top on my hate list would be the heiress <gasps> and the crucible. Whoa, dude. I like them both. Who <laughs> okay, this? A shot back to the 60s. Well, I mean, first, what was wrong with the heiress? <laughs> the heiress, I found the heroine much too good looking. She's well, supposed okay. To be plain. She's supposed to be difficult to marry. Uh, I didn't find the curve of her character from dumb and tongue tied to smart and selfish to be quite as uh, coherent as, let's say, the Cherry Jones version that I saw in. Well, I mean, Cherry oh. Jones is a cute... Well, I mean, she's gotten a little older, but she's cute. Do you find Cherry Jones too pretty to be... Um, and speaking of Kate Pondtay, she's a lesbian. Well, yes, she is. I'm very proud and open and a bicyclist, too. So there you go. Is a <laughs> she's a bi-bicyclist. No, Probably with she rides with a bicyclist. Yeah. <laughs> oh. I, I got that without a seat thing. No, but I'm certain that that is the, the question everybody was asking. Okay, did you see Cherry Jones, and therefore, how does this stack up? Mm-hmm. So, but you didn't find Cherry Jones? I found Cherry Jones to be absolutely definitive. Right. Okay. So, do you think if we hadn't seen her, we would be more, um, you know, forgiving? To, I like the production, but, but... No, I think the Michael Ball, in spite of the precedent of Philip Bosca, stood up quite well as the father. Mm. So, I, I really... Michael Ball was in it? Is that a different Michael Ball from the it's guy who was... different Michael Ball, I've found. Oh. Different, okay. Because I didn't see it mentioned in how, his bio. How odd, there are two Michael Balls. <laughs> and they're each Unix. So, you know, I don't even know. <laughs> oh, no, that's not true. This one isn't as stumpy as the other one. I'm sorry. So what was the other one you hated? You didn't like You didn't like Crucible. I mean, you can't... It's very hard to screw up Crucible. Why, why didn't you like it? It's a match. I, I just... I didn't like the fact that uh, they didn't include the afterthought scene between Abigail and, and John Proctor that, really? that Miller wrote which I've seen and gotten used to, and to me enriches the drama. Okay. And I didn't find any husband and wife chemistry at all. The last hmm. did not break my heart. I will say, however, I love the design. And you love what? The design of the show. Yeah. Oh, okay. I, I like the design of the show. The, the, there was a kind of, <laughs> I don't know what you want to call it, wheel of fortune or... Uh, <laughs> or maybe lottery uh, type of motif going on there, but it, it, it had a nice spirit to it, and, and it really, I, I think, captured the whole thematic uh, movement of it. Okay. I mean, there was nothing, I have to say, that of all the shows I saw, I saw eight or nine of them at the two venues. The ones we've just been talking about were at the Shaw Festival on Niagara, but also then going towards the, the Stratford, there was nothing I saw that I hated. I was bored a few times through stretches of things. Mm-hmm. Like what? Uh, oh, well, well, pretty much any Shakespeare, that first act is going to be like a bit of a drudge sometimes. And um, Magic Fire, which my wife liked more than anything. Well, second most. Who wrote so, Magic Fire? Lillian Garrett Grove. It's one of the only basically new plays that we yeah, saw the whole I've time. It, it's about um, Argentina during sort of their, their troubles of people disappearing a lot, and a family trying to ignore what's going on all around them, and literally within their own kitchen, and, and mm. sort of making a deal, so to speak, with the devil, who's, who's a friend of the family, that they're kind of protected. And just it, assuming it sort of straddled the area when uh, Eva Perone died. Yes. Mm. What did you think of Magic Fire? I actually liked it. Uh, th- True, she was trying to write a novel for the stage, but I, I thought she was uh, doing it rather well and, and taking me to an area that I just love to explore, namely South America and, and some of the uh, the darkness of, of, of human nature down there. So those those are some of the things that we saw at the Shaw. Did you get to Toronto and Lord of the Rings? Oh, uh, yeah. You did see, oh, you did you see that Lord too? of the Rings. Oh, yeah. How'd well, you yeah. like it? Two-hour trip to get to... Toronto, uh, let me put it this way. At the end of the first act, I wanted to shoot myself. Really? It was, it was only an hour long. And I was like, oh, my God, I cannot get into this. I'm so endlessly boring. The, the, the visuals are amazing. Uh, it, I, yeah, it is an eye-popping uh, spectacle. Can and you describe if you're the, into uh, Lord of the Rings and Tolkien a lot more deeply than we are, uh our opinions might be taken with a grain of salt, but uh, I, I couldn't follow it. 
Well, no, but what happened for me was, at the end of the first act, a couple of the other critics were saying, okay, we're going to skip this, and we're going to go to the CN Tower and have dinner, which, which is like the big, tall, mm-hmm. their version of the Sky Needle in, in, right. in Toronto. And I walked outside and said, do I join them? Do I not? It started to rain a little bit. I walked around the block, and I said, no, I'm going to go in. And, you know, I paid. There was only a few things I actually had to pay for that wasn't included in our mm-hmm. uh, basic conference fee. Let me go. Yeah, it's a big thing. You always... I don't ever believe in in first acting, just leaving it for the first act. Oh, if I despise something, I'll... I'll I, I didn't... Well, the first ten years I was reviewing... Well, you just sit there because it could get better. And a lot of times... It, but it never gets that better. Sometimes it gets better. Well, especially if you're reviewing a show. I really I really feel strongly yeah. about that. Well, I went that back. That if you leave... It, it, uh, good. But and, and it got better. And I was... But I, shame on the know. other critics for not going to see both. Oh, no. May, maybe like four or five left. Everybody else. Well, we that. paid for it. <laughs> I think setups in general can be very dreary and very difficult to do, and not everyone does it well. And when you're taking somebody else's work that has just such a loyal following and trying to just get the machinery cranked up, it can be difficult, dreary, mm-hmm. and boring. And they say that that now that the show is going to be booked for London as well, they're going to do more work on it. They're going to, you know, liven it up a little bit, maybe cut it down a little bit. Because they're saying how I mean, long is you it? Can't, it's three and a half hours. And the first act is only one hour. Yeah, there's two intermissions. Oh, okay. So, but and but it, it gets there's more action. I didn't find it so hard to follow. And I did not read the books. I, I read The Hobbit, but I've never read The Lord of the Rings. Mm-hmm. So the one thing that everybody was complaining about, that the story wasn't that clear, was not a problem for me. I found the story clear. Mm-hmm. I just took a long time for me to give a crap. I liked I liked um, the Gollum, though. He was darn good. Gollum was good. Uh... I want me precious. <laughs> again and again and again. <laughs> That's the thing, the whole story again and again. Who's I got the ring? Oh, the ring turns to the last yeah. children's theater thing down here, so I have a special affection for, for Gollum. And, uh, so, um, we uh, have a couple of... Yeah. down there, yeah. what, what is your theater like down in North Carolina? Cool. Uh, North Carolina. It, it's kind of in a down mode what, since the Charlotte Rep folded here. Oh. Uh, but we've had a new infusion of life with the children's theater, because they built this wonderful facility uptown called Imaginon, which is this pioneering collaboration between <laughs> that very classy theater organization and and the main branch of the of the public library, particularly the children's uh, the, the children's uh, section of it. So mm-hmm. it, it, there's really some exciting synergies going on, and they've always been the best technical theater in town. And mm-hmm. now they have a facility that actually is built as a theater, so things are really taking off there. Wonderful. But Charlotte Rep closed. That's Charlotte Rep really? closed now. Well, yeah, that's kind of surprising. Yes. How, how well, you know, you could, you could write to Warren Buffett. I hear he's <laughs> giving away millions. That's did, right. He can, did you hear that? His, his thing. If you form a non- non-profit organization, you can apply to Warren Buffett. He's giving away all his money. Mm-hmm. So... Not a bad idea. I think okay, one of I'll, I'll like him. She give all this money to theater. Because <laughs> <laughs> writing for Dave is definitely non-profit. So hey, thanks. <laughs> thanks a lot, Barry. Well, oh, that's why you're writing. <laughs> <right. laughs> Dave, you have to pay people. Oh, we, we, we just have a couple more minutes, and I, I want to get to a couple more things at the Stratford, and then I want to talk about our, our dinner at the Belfry. Because we've got to mention that. Were the bats there? There were bats with the pricing of that place, I'll tell you. Well, why don't we just talk about that? You, you remember this. There's a, there's a restaurant. This, I don't know why people don't find the sacrilege, but there's a restaurant in Stratford. Mm-hmm. Now, and now, now, Stratford is a, much, is a more interesting town to me than Niagara-on-the-Lake. It's got more shops and stuff. It's a little closer to something like Cedarhurst, whereas you know, not quite as preciously boutique There's a lot more variety of things to do. But you still get your... Seriously, like expensive restaurants, and okay. this one, we passed it a couple of times. Didn't even realize the damn thing was a restaurant because it's in an old church, and this really beautiful, like serious looking church with stained glass and the spires. Mm-hmm. It's a it's a bloody restaurant now. Well, they made one into a disco in Manhattan. I know the limelight. I, I, there's just something weird, wrong about that. You know, I think it's just well, it's right from Manhattan, but. Wrong for, wrong for everywhere else. So, so we go. So we go to this place. It's called the Belfry, and we get the the menus. And, and you want to want to talk about the Belfry a little bit, Perry? 
Well, first of all, you have to realize that the church is like the main restaurant, and it has like five different categories of, of items on its menu. And the night we went, it was absolutely, you know, the, the pews were full. Let's put it that way. Packed top to bottom. And upstairs, you go, you go into this kind of smaller uh, reception room called the Belfry, which has a, a similar men, menu but an abbreviated one with not quite as many tiers of pricing. And it, it, it's designed as a, as a kind of tasting menu. Yeah, they, they call it a tapas style, except all the, the appetizers and entrees are, are priced like freaking like $20, $25 entrees. Who has the money to, to, to tapas style, you know, and then they bring you... Well, that's you. when Canada had no money. They were pricing at the old Canada rate. I guess. Cheapers, creeps. I mean... It was very funny. We were, we were there with the editor of Backstage, who's a lot more sort of outspoken and, and in your face than we are. And they finally brought out her her entree, and she, she looked at her. Sherry, right? Yeah, yeah. Our friend Sherry Eaker, uh-huh. someone fairly well known in uh, New York circles. And you all love her. She just looked at her plate and she said, "You've got to be kidding." <laughs> and you have to notice this woman is as thin as a rail. She, you know, I've seen her eat like a bird. And they bring her like a dot on her plate. And <laughs> she's like, where's my food? <laughs> it took them half an hour to bring out her salad. And it was like four pieces of lettuce on three tomatoes. And I said, oh, you can see why it took them that long to make it. They had to grow it first. It was such a, oh, my God. What a stupid place. And like eight and a half dollars for a bottle. Of, you know, they, they don't come with regular water. They bring over without asking you. Um... You know, the, the sparkling water, uh, you know, Gerald Sima, or one of those those things. And they, Tell they, them tap, you want Le Tap. Yeah, Le Tap, which was not eight and a half dollars a bottle. Jesus H. Anyway, Perry, I'm, I, I, I had I'm to tell you that her dinner was cute. Yeah, mine was pretty good. How was yours? <laughs> <laughs> it was very tasty. I think yeah. I, I lucked out in terms of buying, A, ordering the lamb, and, and, and B, having the foresight to uh, do two appetizers. And the second one, uh, the fries French were fries, yeah. were, oh, uh, excuse me, pommes frites. Pommes frites, yeah. <laughs> but th- those were reasonable. $6 for French fries in a place like that is reasonable. Mon <laughs> <laughs> All right, Perry, I've got to wrap this up. So tell us, where you're, what are you going to next? What are you going to be uh, seeing? What am I going to be seeing? I just saw Parade the, uh, up at the Central Piedmont Community College. And I saw, I uh, just went, came back from Greensboro where I saw a marvelous production of The Matchmaker. Oh, that's nice. And what I'll be reviewing those for uh, Backstage.com. Terrific. And what do you plan on seeing in uh, the near future? The near future? Oh, my gosh. Uh, the next thing that comes up here is probably, let me take a look at my calendar. It's, there's just not very much in the next few weeks. I'm going to have to probably leave town to, to, to get something. But we actually have a kind of festival, uh, which is called a What the Festival, with a lot of uh, unprintable uh, typographical signs to describe it. Uh, and among the things that are going to be do- doing there is the last five years, uh, oh, very true west, and then okay. they call it Attack of the Twenty Four Hour uh, Play Festival, in which uh, oh. six playwrights, and they wrote me into doing this as well, uh, are given twelve hours to write a ten minute play, given a set of prompts. They do that in New York too, I believe. Right. Yeah. Or something and, like that. And then or the, uh, the second twelve hours is devoted to, to producing the play. Yeah, cool. Well, Perry, I've got to wrap this up real quick, but I want to thank you so much for being such a, a cool guest and for sharing uh, our mutual Canadian experiences. And I want to wish you best and best to Sue as well, because she's really neat. Well, I'll give her your, your regards. She's well, probably listening in. Well, I should hope so. I wouldn't have had you on if she wasn't, for God's sake. <laughs> I know that. So you, do, you, you take care of yourself. You've eh? doubled our listenership. Enjoy it. <laughs> exactly. Thank you, Perry. I'll talk to you soon. We'll be right back with more of Dave's Gone By.